the street is a collective of individuals who have lived experience with poverty and homelessness. My hope with this project is to provide education to community organizations, social service organizations, hospitals, universities, colleges, and other public institutions. Business associations, uh, anyone that deals with the poor, with the homeless, and anyone who would be interested in learning more than they see in the pages of their newspapers. My name is Emily Fox and we're here at the Eaton Center to talk about homelessness. And that might seem like an odd combination, but it's really not. Eleven years ago I spent a winter on the street and because of that I spent a lot of time at the Eaton Center. It's warm inside and although I was lucky enough to spend time at a women's shelter, it's common knowledge that the shelters put people out at 8 o'clock every morning and you're not welcomed back until the supper hour. So the Eaton Center became a home away from home for me. And it was warm. And I could smell the coffee and the foods that were being prepared. Mostly, what I wanted was to keep one foot in reality. The only reality that I'd known. The reality where people work, and they have homes, and they do their Christmas shopping, and they buy gifts for loved ones. And I thought as long as I could maintain that connection, as long as I could see people that had those values, I wouldn't lose touch with reality. Because reality in the shelter included women that had been abandoned and disenfranchised. And they were roughly three groups of women. There was a group that were mentally ill. And they had been abandoned years ago. But with the deinstitutionalization of the psychiatric hospitals, a lot of them ended up in women's shelters or on the street. There was another group that were refugees from war-torn countries, and they'd come to Canada in the hope that they would find safety or freedom or security. They found themselves on the streets, some of them with children. Bosnia had just blown up, so the aftermath of that was that there were a lot of women and children from Bosnia. And the third group were mainly women 55 to 60 years old, women who had given their lives to their families, only to find out that their marriages were falling apart. And they were left in their twilight years to look for a job and a place to live. I didn't want to become involved with that reality. It was like a bad nightmare. And I preferred to stay involved with people that I met at the Eaton Center. But a strange thing happened that winter. My realities shifted. The more time I spent at the Eaton Center, the more it became the fantasy and the delusion. And at night when I would go back for supper with the women, they became my reality. And the strangest part of that is it's been 11 years and my reality hasn't shifted back. So I think when we talk about strategies and solutions for people who are poor, people who are homeless, it's fine to talk about building more homes and it's fine to give people more money and to stock up those food banks, but that's not the real problem. The real problem is that once you've been tossed away and rejected by your society, you're not always choosing to go back to that way of life. I belong to Voices from the Street because I think it's important that people know the truth about what it's like to be on the street. When the voices around the table that make decisions, the voices of research and the voices of data and the voices of knowledge and policy gather, I hope you'll remember that there are voices from the street. I'm Phil from Voices from the Street, and uh, it was in April of 2003 I found myself homeless and, and living in Hyde Park. I'd had a problem with depression and with drinking as well, and this is where it led me to. 
And I remember I was off in the woods back in here, uh, and there were occasionally people pass by, like there is right now, and there were all the walking the dogs or couples, and there was laughter and there was happiness for them, but there, there was none of that for me. I was completely disconnected from society. They were the lucky ones because they had hope, they had a place to go. They had somebody there for them, and I had nothing. I may as well have been invisible. Um, I wanted to be invisible. Uh, I remember the loneliness, the distress, being miserable. I had no idea what to do or, or where to go. And even walking down the street, people would ignore me. Uh, people didn't want to talk to me. They, they would avoid me, not that I blame them. But that, that entire being di disconnected from life and, and society was, uh, was such a horrible feeling that I, I really can't explain it. If it wasn't for a friend of mine that was reaching out for me, uh, talking to me, treating me like I was a human being, and willing to go the extra mile for me, I don't know what would have happened to me. I may have still been here. I, I may not be. I don't know. It, it, it's hard to say. But I needed that at that time. It, it was the one connection that I had, and it was all I had. I needed somebody to reach out to me and uh, provide me that opportunity. And I've never been one for wanting handouts or anything like that. I didn't want any of that. All I needed was a hand up and somebody to give me an opportunity to show them what I could do and what I could be to treat me like a human being, to treat me like I, and they would treat anybody else. And I remember a couple of weeks ago I was in um, the OW office talking to my worker, updating my file, and she happened to mention that I'd been on vacation the last three years. And if this has been a vacation, and I need a new travel agent because it's been anything but. Hi, I'm Wendy. I'm with. I'm a member of Voices from the Street. Um, having experienced abuse both as a child and as a common law wife, at the age of 21, I knew the signs of spousal abuse. Uh, I had learned to accept a certain amount of abuse. I used to grade it. I used to rationalize, you know, as long as it only happened two or three times a week or, you know, I could hide the evidence, it was okay. Um, I had, um, when it got more severe, you know, the neighbors called in the police. Uh, I was, you know, just as scared of them as I was of, uh, of him. They're both very large, intimidating. And um, uh, at that point, I still believed um, abuse was a consequence of being a woman. Um, as a mother, however, I could not accept uh, that volatile environment or abuse to raise my daughter in. At that point, I made the decision to leave, and I wound up in a woman's shelter. Uh, and uh, only 21 with a three-month-old baby. And, you have a bunch of strangers, four or five in a room, and I held her to my breast all night to protect her from the strangers in the room and the cockroaches on the wall and from unknowns in that situation. Uh, you wear your clothes to bed to make sure that the other residents don't steal your clothes while you're sleeping. And um, it was at that point, you know, realizing how alone you are and if this is a big decision. Um, I had different fears and I had to develop new uh, survival tactics and uh, on my own. Because even dealing with welfare workers, you know, you're, you know, all of a sudden it's like you have to explain 